So please join me in welcoming the President of the United States, Joe Biden. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I want to thank Doug and Kamala. You know, uh, Jill, my wife, or uh, her husband, uh, <laughs> you all think I'm kidding. The, uh, Jill wanted to be here. She just got back from a trip to Kenya and, and uh, Namibia. And uh, it was a very substantive trip, powerful trip as a follow up to the African Leaders Summit. And we hosted here in December to deepen the relationship between America and countries across that continent. She met with the presidents and first ladies of both countries. She spoke to more than 1,000 young people, the first generation born out of apartheid in Namibia, and empowered them to as keepers of democracy. In Kenya, she met families affected by devastating drought and food insecurity and made worse by Putin's brutal assault on Ukraine. And it made it clear that America's commitment to Africa is real, and Jill showing up just being there is testament to that commitment. It was a trip she'll always remember, and while she couldn't be here tonight, we're honored to welcome all of you to the White House, your house, Black History Month. <clears throat> a special thanks to members of the most diverse administration in history who are here. The most diverse administration in history, right, Jim? Jim Carver, <laughs> I tell you what, man. Father, I wouldn't be standing here without Jim. Thanks to the members of Congress for here, starting with the first black party leader in Congress in our nation's history, Hakeem Jeffries. <laughs> He's here in spite of the fact when he ran the first time I campaigned for him. The <laughs> and the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Stephen Harsford. <laughs> Stephen, where are you? <laughs> I campaigned for him, too. I don't know what this means. They don't talk to me anymore, though. I'm only kidding. And the civil rights and business leaders are here today. And by the way, I've worked a long time with the presidents of uh, my home state, HBCU, Delaware State. Yes, sir. Hey. Now, I, by the way, you said you played basketball. I want to introduce you to an All-American. Come here, pal. <laughs> See this guy here? He's better than Tiny Archibald. This is a guy, first, first team all, not, not a joke, not a joke. He would have been playing pro ball, except his feet got flatter when he got older. <laughs> his one daughter ran my office in Delaware for a long time, the reason I'm here. And his second daughter here happens to be the congressman from the state of Delaware. But this guy, not only can he play ball, the reason his daughters have this kind of, uh, I don't know, spark to change the world is because he did that, too. So anyway, I want to say thank you. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Good to see you. You know, I know, uh, I know real power when I see it, the Divine Nine. We're honored to have presidents, all the presidents here tonight. And I want to thank him. For the, and by the way, you know, I'm not smart. I, I, I may be a white boy, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> I know where the power is. I know where the power You think I'm joking. I learned a long time ago about the Divine Nine. And that's why I spent so much time at Delaware State campaigning and organizing my campaign in Delaware. But uh, all the presidents are here. I think we're, I know, I don't think, I know we are the first administration in history to not only have all the presidents here at one time, but we have a permanent office here for the Divine Nine. <laughs> but I got worried. We got so many damn guys working with me from Morgan State. Morgan, man, I'm a little worried about it. You know. Anyway, I, I'm not going to get in the middle of that. <laughs> I shouldn't kid about it. I should know better. I should know better. Look, folks, we also want to thank the marching band of Virginia State University. <laughs> Welcome you all as you enter the White House. And of course, thanks to Dwayne, uh, who you just heard from. Dwayne, 
I, I, I'm sure you didn't have a chance to check out Delaware State uh, before Howard, but How Howard's okay. I mean, Howard's a good school. I just, by the way, I'm the only guy, for all the power in this room, I'm the only guy who had the president of a Divine Nine school work for him for years. And he got his doctorate while he was doing work, working for me, and then he went off and became a president. What the hell did he want to do that for? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, all kidding aside, I want to, you know, you may be president one day. Here's the one commitment I want from you. And that is when they say, Joe Biden's out in the waiting room, you promise me you will not say, Joe who? <laughs> so, deal? No? All right. <laughs> As, uh, as he just, Dwayne just referenced, uh, he recently, we recently hosted a screening of the movie Till. We hosted a screening because it's important to say from the White House for the entire country to hear, history matters. Yes. History matters, and black history matters. Yes. Look, I can't just choose to learn what we want to know. We learn what we should know. Right. We have to learn everything, the good, the bad, the truth, and who we are as a nation. That's what great nations do. That's what great nations do, and we're a great nation. And that's why the greatest historian, great historian, Carter G. Woodson, dean of Howard University, more than 100 years ago, had a vision and a purpose. He thought there should be a Black History Month. Yes. First guy to do it, that I'm the best of my knowledge. And it's turned into Black History, I think he said Black History Week the first time. Yes. And, uh, and it turned into Black History Month. And look, the legacy that's been continued by the Association for the Study of African Life, of African American Life and History. It's a legacy that continues today as we celebrate the vast contributions black Americans have made to American history. You know, we celebrate all of you and the progress we've made together the past two years. Progress to lay the foundation for a stronger, more resilient, more equitable economy that grows from the bottom up and the middle out. So the poor have a ladder up, the middle class do well, and the wealthy always do well when everybody else does well. So I ain't worried about them. All kidding aside, they do well. This idea somehow we're only focusing on middle class and the poor. The wealthy do very well when the middle class are doing well. We created over 12 million jobs, the strongest job growth of any presidency <laughs> in the first two years of our history. Black unemployment is near record lows. Wages for black workers are up in the two strongest years ever for small business creation, which includes strong growth in black small businesses. And guess what? It's not just the business that gets started. Imagine what the neighborhoods would be without those small businesses, without the beauty shop, the drugstore. It's the center of what creates a community, the engines and glue that keep communities going. So it's not just the small business. More black Americans have health insurance today than any previous time in American history. And with the help of many of you, we've got millions of people insured under the Affordable Care Act by making it easier for them to sign up and making it more affordable, saving millions and millions of dollars overall at, for people making and people getting an $800, year, $800 a year uh, break in their health insurance. For the first time, we've empowered Medicare to negotiate drug prices. We finally beat them. Finally took them on because of the people in this room. That means instead of paying three, four hundred bucks a month for insulin, as of January 1st, it's capped at $35 a month, period, for those on Medicare. The parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, we also capped out-of-pocket costs for seniors in Medicare at a maximum of $2,000 per year, no matter what their costs are. And I kept in more than $2,000 beginning in 2025 because some of those cancer drugs they have to pay for are $10,000, $12,000, $14,000 a total, year. Total, total $2,000 a year, no matter how much your costs are. We passed the law to make the biggest investment ever in climate than any time anywhere in history. And look, in particular focus, uh, what we talked about a lot, Jim and others and I, we talked about those fence line communities. Those fence clan communities suffered the most consequences of being smothered by pollution. Think of Cancer Alley in Louisiana or Route 9 in the state of Delaware. They're the first out we we're going to take care of. They're the first of the Americans we're going to take care of. Yes. In this new and our once in a generation infrastructure laws modernize Americans' roads, bridges, ports, airports, and with equity at the center of everything we do. Our Justice 40 initiative means that 40% of the overall benefits of clean energy, transit, 
and clean transit can, and many other things is going to go to those underserved communities. That's the objective. We're replacing, as was mentioned by my colleague, my, my vice president, our vice president, poisonous lead pipes for every child in America being eliminated. We got schools, 400,000 schools and nurseries that have these lead pipes in them. We can turn on a faucet at home and drink clean water. We're delivering affordable high-speed internet to every single household. No parent should have to pull up in front of McDonald's for their kid to be able to do their homework. No, no, it's for real. Speaking of education, instead of a photo ops, we're delivering nearly $6 billion, I promise we would do $6 billion for, to HBCUs. <laughs> Without the kind of foundations that other schools have, we got to make sure they have the same laboratories, the same research capacity that everybody else, because uh, their students can do anything anybody else can do. But they need to have the, the, the facility to do it. We're going to increase their teaching and training capacity and attract millions of dollars from the private sector, investing in industries of the future like cybersecurity. One of the best ways to close the racial wealth gap, as was referenced earlier, is to expand access to home ownership. That's how the vast majority of the middle class has done it. That's how they built wealth and stability and passed it down to their children and grandchildren. That's why we're expanding efforts to build back a generational wealth through home ownership and aggressively, aggressively combating racial discrimination in housing. Folks, my administration oversees hundreds of billions of dollars in federal contracts for everything from re refurbishing aircraft carrier decks to installing railings in federal buildings. So as President of the United States, I get to award those contracts. Most of you don't know, I didn't even know, I've been around a long time, but back in 1933, they passed an Ameri Buy American le le legislation. It doesn't violate any international rules. It says that the money the President of the United States has given by the Congress to award contracts, you should buy America first. It's been around a long time, but guess what? The vast majority of previous presidents, Democrat and Republican, didn't apply it. But if you want to build anything in America, it's got to be an American product and buy American. No, I'm not joking. That's why black and brown owned businesses and other underserved communities have been historically underrepresented in such federal contracting. I commit it by 2025, we're going to increase that 15% of every single contract I award as President of the United States will go to black and brown small businesses. <laughs> And the effect of that is that'll bring an additional $100 billion in federal contracting money to these communities. And to deliver equal justice under the law, we're building a federal bench with judges that reflect all of America, led by Katanji Brown Jackson. I promised you a number of things. Very specifically, I said the first nominee to the Supreme Court is going to be a black woman. And that I was going to pick a black woman to be Vice President of the United States of America. <laughs> We've appointed more black women to the Federal Circuit course than every other president in history combined. Every single South Carolina. And by the way, Dick Durbin of Illinois deserves enormous credit for that getting done. Look. After Senate Republicans blocked the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act last year, with your help, and some of you in this room actually helped me write it, I signed a historic executive order requiring key elements of that bill in federal law enforcement. I banned chokeholds, greatly restricted no-knock warrants, created a national database for officers' misconduct, and to lighten use of force policies, emphasizing de-escalation in the way in which police officers work to take a fresh approach to recruit, hire, train law enforcement, all of which are tied to effective and accountable community policing and advance public trust and safety. And as I made clear in the State of the Union with the presidents of Tyree Nichols as our guest, his mom and dad, we need a Congress to come together to pass police reform legislation. <laughs> With your help, I signed the first major gun safety legislation in nearly 30 years. And guess what? I'll say it again. We're going to ban assault weapons before we're out of here. Ban them, ban them, ban them. Another thing about equal justice, I'm keeping my promise. No one should be in prison for the mere possession of marijuana. Too many minorities are in prison for that. So what I've passed, we should pardon them, 
expunge their records as if it never happened so they have a chance again in society. And folks, I just signed legislation most people don't think is going to be very con consequential, but it is to the people there. Legislation to cap the cost of phone calls in prisons that prisons charge incarcerated people just to step toward basic dignity. And folks, last year after the mass shooting in Buffalo, Jill and I spent time, I met with all those families. I also covered, uh, um, convened the first of its kind White House summit against hate fuel violence that many of you called for and supported. Together we're saying loud and clearly that America, in America, hate will not prevail. Hate will not prevail. Silence is complicity. Yes. Silence, and we're not going to remain silent. Denialism is worse and it is unacceptable. With your help, I signed a law more than 100 years in the making to finally make lynching a federal hate crime to Emmett Till. Amazing, 100 years ago. And it's astounding. You've joined me at the bill signing for other victories to protect the right of interracial and same-sex marriages, to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. You're, you know, You've been key partners on executive orders I've signed advancing racial equality and justice and support underserving communi underserved communities. But we have to keep going. We're not finished yet. Many of you have been working on these issues for a long, long time. We've gotten a lot done together, but we have a lot more to do. And people know, we have to first of all let people know what we've done, even in your communities. They don't know all that we've done. We have to make it clear. And we're not stopping because that gives them confidence that we're going to keep going. Remind them why it's important to get engaged. And their voices do matter. So we've got to talk about it. Spread the word. Defend our progress. Finish the job. For example, my student debt relief plan, which will help tens of millions of folks and, uh, on Pell Grants hit hard by the pandemic. About 70 percent of black college students receive Pell Grants. For many black students, this savings will be so significant, including wiping out their entire student debt completely. But currently, the only thing blocking that plan is opponents of the plan suing us. Today, there was argued in the Supreme Court whether or not the, the, my plan is, is, is able to be done by executive order. They're the same folks who had hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars in pandemic relief loans forgiven, and many of them in Congress, by the way, Republicans who voted for tax sets for overwhelmingly benefit the wealthiest people in America, who are the people who paid to bring these, these suits. Look, folks, you got to give me a break. My administration is making our case in the Supreme Court, and I'm confident the legal authority to carry out that plan is there. I promise you, I have your back, and this is so much more we can do. Folks, we have to stand together to protect women's right to choose. We have to continue to fight for racial justice. We cut black child poverty in half in 2021 because of the child tax credit. Look, we need to help make that tax credit permanent now. I signed the Bipartisan Electoral Count Reform Act to protect the will of the people and the peaceful transfer of power. But we must get the Congress to vote on the John Lewis Voting Rights yeah. Advancement Act. And the Freedom to Vote Act. I made clear that we cannot let the filibuster be an obstacle protecting that sacred right to vote. Look, let me close with this. I'm going quickly because you've been standing a long time, and I apologize. Last month, it would have been what would have been Dr. King's 94th birthday, I spoke in the pulpit at Ebenezer on a Sunday service. The next day, on Dr. King's holiday, I joined Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network to talk policy. The day after, we stood here in the East Room with Steph Curry, an NBA champion who was a supporter of the goal and the goals champion Golden State Warriors, that continued a storied tradition of black athletes playing a role bigger than just the game they play, speaking out against racism, standing up for equality, encouraging people to vote, empowering children and their families to eat healthy, learn, and play in safe places. Rallying the country against gun violence in faith and action, policy and culture, and so much more, we see the vibrancy of black culture and history enriching all of American life. All of American life. History that can't be buried because it lives 
and the soul of this nation. It's who we are. It's who we are. It matters. As the gospel song sings, we've come too far from where we started. Nobody told me the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Yes. Folks, folks, I don't think the good Lord brought us anything this far to leave us behind. We just have to remember. We just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America, and there's nothing beyond our capacity. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So happy Black History Month. May God bless you all.